put here. Oh, we no, will. I'm you want to introduce me? I'm introducing him. This is Henry Matthews. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm very excited to reach this stage of the Renaissance in Italy. It brings me so many wonderful memories. Uh, and I, uh, I'll take you to some places that some of you know. And I hope I can fill in some details that are new to you. So let's just start with a, a map. I'm sure you all know uh, the map of Italy pretty well. This is Rome, of course, and Florence is further north. Last week, we were in Ravenna looking at those beautiful mosaics, uh, but no, no mosaics much here. Uh, and then uh, uh, Pisa, Genoa, and so on. But let's get to Florence. I love this picture. It's a little fuzzy, uh, but uh, it, I love the idea of looking at the city uh, with the river going by and the bridges over it. Uh, the, I think this is the um, Ponte Vecchio. Well, why is it doing that? The city hall with the great watchtower and the cathedral. And the central element in this lecture will be how Brunelleschi managed to put a dome onto a gaping opening that was not built in a way that could take a dome. Uh, but he solved the problem. Of course, it's really impossible to go to Florence without looking at the art. Uh, and uh, I don't have time to do that. So I thought that I would just point out the huge change that took place in Florence. Here's a Sienese painting uh, with this beautiful gold black background. Uh, but there's no idea uh, of a, an interior space that has any depth to it. And so when Giotto began to create a greater sense of reality, it astonished people. Uh, I remember reading a description of an Italian from Florence going into the Scrovegni, Scrovegni Chapel painted by Giotto. And he was expecting the people to start walking around on the walls. They were so real. So we now, in the Renaissance with Fra de Polipi, for example, uh, we see depth of space. Uh, and it was here in Florence that Brunelleschi, who we will talk about as an architect, uh, invented the art of perspective. A few more giottos to give the idea of the sort of reality that stands there. The, in this dramatic lamentation, uh, the figures are three-dimensional, and the distance is pal palpable. And then we come to Masaccio in the Brancacci Chapel in Florence, the tribute money. Such a dramatic picture. But we have to get to the architecture. And the Masaccio also, uh, the Trinity in Santa Maria Novella. And as we go into some of these churches, you have to remember uh, that around the walls are, are many uh, amazing works of art. Piridella Francesca's Baptism of Christ uh, shows a kind of hopefulness that characterizes the Renaissance. So here is the cathedral, Santa Maria del Fiore, with the dome built by Brunelleschi against all odds, and to its left, the baptistry. But I will look at some of his earlier work before we get to the dome of the cathedral, uh, which was his big life's work. 
and there uh, you, you see the cathedral with the dome. The facade was not actually built until the 19th century, but they couldn't figure out how to do the dome, so instead they built the bell tower, the campanula. The campanile, it's a campanile because it holds bells, and a bell is a campanello. Italian is such a beautiful language. I just wanted to show a difference between the Italian Gothic Florence Cathedral built in the 14th century and the French Gothic, which is higher and narrower and more energetic. Uh, one feels that there's something a little ponderous about the Italian version, but I will relate it to a place that we saw recently, the Basilica of Constantine, which has huge solid arches on either side. Either side looks like a great triumphal arch, two of them facing each other with the vault between them. Florence Cathedral is distinctly Gothic, uh, but the bays are square rather than uh, rather than rectangular in the French ones. Florentine architecture in the medieval era had a distinctive character. There is some Roman influence in it. The columns, for example, which we may which we'll see close up late, late, later on, uh, and the arches, but this is the vocabulary uh, that Brunelleschi was familiar with uh, when he started work in Florence. In 1402, a competition was held for the design of panels to go in the doors of the baptistry. And the two joint winners of the competition were Ghiberti and Brunelleschi on the right. Ghiberti actually, uh, they, they were told that they both won, uh, but they would have to work together. Uh, but Ghiberti would be the, the leader and Brunelleschi went off to Rome in a half. Uh, he, that was not enough for him. He wanted to win. Uh, his picture is very dramatic. Uh, look at that angel whizzing down uh, with flowing robes behind him or her. And they're just holding Abraham's knife uh, from Isaac's throat. And these are the doors uh, that were made, were made. Ghiberti spent his whole life on it. And maybe Brunelleschi would have had to do that if he'd won. But he did a great many different things, which we will see. So there's one detail, uh, which is showing on the right uh, a space where perspective is really palpable. You can see the three-dimensionality of that space behind. And Ghiberti had learnt that from Brunelleschi. Another artist who was in Florence at this time was Donatello. Uh, here we see his David standing on the head of Goliath. Well, uh, wait a minute. That's it, yes. David uh, and Donatello also did St. George, looking very fine there. And the two of them, it's believed, went off to Rome to look at ancient Roman ruins. So here it is in the 18th century uh, when it was uh, illustrated by Piranesi. But there would have been a lot more of the Roman architecture 
uh, at this time. Uh, the popes of Rome used ancient Rome as a stone quarry, and many of the palazzi uh, and the Vatican buildings were built with stone that was taken from Roman monuments. But that's what, uh, so they would have seen more than this. Brunelleschi must have been absolutely astonished by the Pantheon, as anyone would. The largest, the first really large dome built anywhere, and the largest dome in the world until the 19th century. Brunelleschi probably would have been astonished by the way that the ribs running vertically and horizontally uh, in the dome uh, gave it a kind of sense of energy. If it had been just a putting bowl upside down uh, with a smooth surface, I don't think it would have had uh, the vibrant quality that it has now. And of course, uh, this meant that it was much more efficient to build because each of these coffers, as they're called, dug out, uh, saved weight. Brunelleschi went back to Florence and his first architectural commission uh, was a foundling hospital uh, for the Silk Guild. Uh, ostentatious, uh, charitable building uh, for the poor in a city where I'm sure there were a lot of foundlings. Uh, and Brunelleschi was inspired by Rome. And yet, as you see, looking at the picture on the right, he is really using just as much the vocabulary of medieval Florence. This arcade with many arches carried on slender columns is so elegant. And this really is the beginning of a Florentine style. Let's take a look at a closer detail. And then let's look down at this beautiful arcade. You know, you might notice that the vaults don't have ribs to them uh, or any, any other markings on them. Uh, they could, are called domical vaults, vaults because they were uh, like domes sort of attached to the columns uh, with, with pendentives that merge with, with, with the surface. But these capitals of the columns come from Rome. There's the interior uh, of the Foundling Hospital, beautiful courtyard. And then at the back, there are residential buildings and a garden. But let's go on to the Church of San Lorenzo, commissioned by the Medici family. Of course, you've all heard of the Medici, the wealthy bankers who were the greatest patrons of art, perhaps, that the world had ever seen. Uh, they supported artists. They even had Michelangelo living in their uh, palazzo at one time uh, to support him. But they commissioned this church. You can, we'll begin by looking at this part of it, uh, the old sacristy as it's called, which was the first thing built uh, by Brunelleschi in this way. You can imagine from the curve at the top, and we'll see it later, a dome uh, pendentives with these roundels in the dome. And then the surfaces of the walls are articulated uh, by columns and entablature. So here is a vocabulary that Brunelleschi brought 
from Rome. But there's nothing in Rome that looks like this. He has created a Florentine style. This is the dome uh, of the old sacristy. Small, supported on pendentives with roundels in them, and divided uh, into segments by, by ridges. So he has, Brunelleschi has brought something from Rome and created something new. So this is the interior uh, of San Lorenzo on the left. And on the right, the early Christian basilica in Rome of Santa Sabina. You can see distinct similarities. Both of them uh, have a central space divided by columns and arches from the aisles. Uh, they have an apse at the end. But there's something about Brunelleschi's, Brunelleschi's work. He, from Lo Rome, uh, he has learnt that proportion and rhythm, but particularly proportion uh, and the, the rule of geometry uh, rather than happenstance gives this space a serene character. It was never finished. When I was first in Florence, I wanted to get out a bag of mortar and have some, bring some stones so that I could finish it. But <laughs> that's just, that's a lie. I'm thinking of it now. I want to do that. And the, there was a plan a few years ago to put a facade on it, but I don't think it's happened. His other church of, this, of a similar kind is the Church of Santo Spirito, Santo Spirito. If we look at the plan, we can see around uh, the crossing of the nave and the transepts a central space uh, with a circle in it. Uh, that's where a dome was built. And around that dome are three squares and a long rectangle made up of equal squares. And then the, the square of the crossing is the same as the squares in the transepts. And then around the edge, the chapels are squares of half that dimension. I remember standing in this space, really awed by the beauty that comes from proportion and harmony. I first went to Florence when I was 17 years old. I was at school in Germany and I hitchhiked there. And I was in awe of this architecture. I stayed in a cheap room just five minutes walk from here, came back uh, several times. Then I went on my honeymoon with Susan a later, at a later period, and that was glorious too. She had lived in Florence for a year. We were, she was an art historian, and so we took our fill. I don't know why. I do know why. Let's skip that. So Bruno Bileski applied principles that he'd discovered in ancient Rome, particularly harmony and proportion. But his architectural vocabulary came from the baptistry and San Miniato. Uh, but he gave it something totally new. Around the edge of this church, there are little chapels. They actually have curved walls. It doesn't show so well here. And then each one in it uh, has an altar. And many of them have important Renaissance masterpieces 
if we weren't around every one of them, we wouldn't get out in time for dinner. So one more uh, early Florentine uh, buildings by Brunelleschi. This is the Pazzi Chapel. The Pazzi family uh, were like the Medicis and others, bankers, extremely wealthy, and able to commission uh, Brunelleschi to design uh, chapels for them. Once again, it's perfectly clear that all geometry uh, and even numbers all, um, guide the architect uh, in his design. Now, the portico is a sort of early Renaissance version of a Roman triumphal arch. It's, but it's much lighter. The triumphal arch is immensely heavy. Uh, the columns that stand forward from it stand on high, solid bases. But this is so elegant and light. So it's clear, again, that Brunelleschi is developing a new vocabulary uh, for Florence. Here's the space inside, uh, behind the columns and the arch. We look up and see a coffered ceiling uh, and a small dome in the center uh, with circles in it. And now we move on to the interior. Like the old sacristy, the wall is articulated uh, with pilasters and an entablature taken from Roman architecture. They organize the space uh, with a potent, simple geometry that creates a sense of beauty. And now let's look up at half of the dome and all of the dome. So Brunelleschi saw the Pantheon, but he didn't treat it with a series of coffers, uh, square recesses in it. Uh, he gave it a much smaller scale. The ribs are, are very appropriate. And then next, a view down from the dome. I wasn't up there. Uh, wait a minute. I wasn't up there, but here's, again, that rigorous geometry and sense of order. Now, there was, in Italy at this time, a beginning of a desire to create churches that were completely centralized. And his last building, uh, Santa Maria de, degli Angeli uh, in, in Florence, illustrates this. The center is an octagon. Off the side of it are seven chapels and one uh, uh, for the entryway. Uh, the, at the bottom of the picture uh, is uh, the apse. And this has, in fact, been turned into a university building. Now let's just take a look at the beauty of its proportions. You can see that Brudoneski is absolutely in control uh, of the form. Today, it's university seminar rooms. And uh, I was able to walk in. I could have attended a seminar. And it's nice to see uh, it used in some way that will bring plenty of people into it. But now we must come to Santa Maria, it's, uh, it's, uh, the, to the cathedral, Santa Maria del Fiore. No, that was 
to the cathedral. You can see when Brudelewski got back from Rome, there was still a gaping opening. The crossing was not covered. They had built the nave in the Gothic style, as we've seen it before. And then there were three apses leading off this octagonal central space. But nobody knew how to build a dome. And so they'd just forgotten about it and waited for Brunelleschi to come. And he had the solution. He was a very practical man. He was actually a goldsmith. He was a member of the Guild of Goldsmiths. Uh, and his first works were small uh, items of gold or small sculptures. <laughs> but he was a practical man. He could <laughs> work out things like this. How, how do you lift heavy stones up into uh, a, a half-constructed dome? So he had a horse going round and round, uh, pulling a rope attached, uh, uh, sorry, with, with a spindle on his, um, uh, on his back. Uh, and that's how it worked. Brunelleschi's solution, he realized he couldn't build a dome like the Pantheon because it would have been much, much, much too heavy. He had to reduce its weight. He also was aware that it would cost a tremendous amount to build, as the Romans had done, a complete form under it. Under the dome of the Pantheon was a wooden structure as big as the dome of the, the interior of the dome of the Pantheon, with all the coffers, uh, the square depressions uh, uh, in it. Um, we must have taken tremendous amount of lumber and energy. Of course, the Romans had slaves. Uh, they could get timber. Maybe they got timber from far away on the slopes of uh, Turkey. I've just been writing a book about Lycia, and I was thinking about uh, how the trees, uh, huge trees of the mountains, cedars, were felled and sent all over the Roman Empire as a valuable export. Maybe the, maybe the timber came even from, uh, from there for the Pantheon. But Brunelleschi saw the problem of building the cathedral, not how it would look, but how you, how you would build it. So he organized a series of ribs running vertically, vertically but they were restrained uh, by struts that rang horizontally. So they would build up a little bit and then complete a circle. And that circle could not fall in on itself. So they could keep going up and up. But then at the base, uh, he needed to have something that would, um, would withstand uh, the desire of the stone to thrust outwards. So let's go, let's go to the next one. This picture on the left, or the middle one, shows the scaffolding uh, that he built, which was just for the workers to be able to reach the underside of the dome. But it did not support the dome itself. There was a ring of stone around it. Uh, and then one layer up, which I think perhaps will, no, this, I think this is, I have to look at this one. Um, sorry. Um, the, there was a ring of, of wood uh, which Oh, could give, give some tension to hold the ribs apart. But gradually, they worked their way up. 
building complete circles inside that were self-supporting. But as you look on the left here, uh, you will see that there are two go domes with a gap between them. Tremendous weight coming down uh, here, though it's penetrated by round windows. So Brunelleschi got the commission uh, to supervise the building of the dome because he understood the process, but there was nothing wrong uh, with it to look at either. So there is that structure again. The other way, I keep doing it. And here is a section through the dome as it was built. I think we can see clearly enough that this dome being much higher, more vertical than the Pantheon, isn't going to be pushing out so far. So here it is, uh, vertical, pushing its weight downwards. And it never needed centering under it to hold the structure up until it was all finished. And you can actually walk up between the two leaves of the dome, or the, the, the two surfaces. Someone who's walked up there? Good for you, Bob. <laughs> I, I, once, I once met my son in Florence. I, w I was leading a bus tour for Rick Steves around Europe. And my son joined us in Florence. And I met him at the station. And I said, there's something we've got to do. We, we've got very little time. And we've got to go up the dome. And I remember running up this dome. Uh, with him and coming out on top and looking at the incredible uh, view. And there it, it is with the baptistry uh, to the lower right, the bell tower designed actually by the painter Giotto, the medieval cathedral with its 19th century facade, and Brunelleschi's dome holding its own uh, uh, among everything. One little detail of the dome uh, is this, I think it might be called an excedra, uh, which is much more Roman looking. It's, it's a slightly different uh, appearance. And that was something that Brunelleschi added. And then, Years later, the interior was painted. And I, I've been to Florence Cathedral a good many times. I've not spent much time looking at the dome. It doesn't seem quite right to me, but maybe some of you know better. It yes. It was painted by Vasari a century later. And it's uh, a last judgment, influenced, obviously, by Michelangelo's last judgment in the Sistine Chapel, uh, but different. And here's a detail of it. So Florence Cathedral was being constructed till the end of Brunelleschi's life. He lived to see everything ex completed except the upper part of the lantern on top. Well, now we get on to another topic. Um, the obsession in Italy with centralized churches. They believed that pure geometry was pleasing to God, even if churches with plans like this were not very practical uh, for congregations. <laughs> but several architects succeeded in building centralized churches. And then 
here at the top of the picture uh, is the idea of an ideal city with a circular church in it. What could be more perfect than a circular church, even if it's not very practical? And then the palazzi on either side of them are symmetrically arranged. So we'll look at a few centralized churches. Uh, this one, designed by Francesco di Giorgio, uh, long before the cathedral dome in Florence had got very far. Uh, this has four wings to it. Actually, uh, the west side is a little longer, so it does have a bit more space for the congregation. But if you look up at the dome, uh, you will see that the architect is <laughs> really excited by this symmetry and order, seeing a central dome and four vaults going in the directions away from it. Giuliano de San, da San Gallo, who also was involved in St. Peter's, as we will see, designed Santa Maria delle Carceri <coughs> at Prato, never quite finished. Uh, but you can see that he follows a vocabulary, not unlike the Florentine uh, vocabulary, but without arches. And again, this sense of order, symmetry, is absolutely fundamental to its design. Now we get to a very important artist, architect named Bramante, who was the first who had a go at building the new St. Paul's. And he had a commission to build a very small church. It's actually the church of Santa Maria Presso San Satiro, near San Satiro. It didn't seem to have a name of its own. But look how it follows Renaissance principles. A high Renaissance features, a centralized plan under a dome, a, a Greek cross plan. Pendentives make the transition from four arches to the dome. A coffered dome and barrel vault are added, and the walls are articulated with classical orders. So we are looking at, we think, a centralized church. But Bramante was not given a chance to do what he wanted. He, he wanted to have the dome in the middle and four equal arms uh, of a cross. But his clients had the good sense to say, no, we need space for the congregation. So this is actually a fake. Look down the nave. We're absolutely convinced uh, that the space beyond the dome, beyond the altar, is a three-dimensional space. But now look at it. It's not there. It's, he's, he understood the art of perspective and he could create an illusion of that. He must have been much happier when he designed this called Tempietto, a little temple. Temple, of course, being a classical word rather than a Christian word. And this was a, at the monastery of San Pietro in Montorio in Rome, built in 1502. So we got to the beginning of the 16th century. And he's able to make it completely circular and cover it uh, with a central dome. But it's not actually a church for services. It is the site of the place where St. Peter was martyred. And so it is sort of like a reliquary remembering this event. But Bramante has followed 
principles that he believes in. It's interesting that he chose the Doric order uh, because that was not much used in the Renaissance. It was based perhaps on the temple of Vesta in Rome, uh, which has lost its entablature and its top, but it never had a dome. Uh, but Bramante put two good things together. This is the this shows this detail shows that it's in the Doric order. Uh, so I've explained that it has the triglyphs and metopes that we see on the Parthenon, though we can't really see them very well. It's the same order there. And that was unusual in the Renaissance. Oh, I thought that's what we were looking at. Um, never mind. I'm sure you're all familiar uh, with this drawing by Leonardo da Vinci, which really expresses the perfection of the circle and the human body. This is the age of humanism. We're not ashamed of our bodies, uh, so we can represent them uh, as an emblem of beauty. On the same, on the right side, uh, there's a sketch by, or two sketches by uh, Leonardo of churches. Again, centralized, high domes, not very practical in there for use. There's a closer look at those drawings. And then we come to the church of Santa Maria della Consolazione, St. Mary of the Consolation at Todi, uh, between Florence and Rome, designed by Cola da Caprarola. It's very, very high, as you can see, or you, you can imagine, though you can't see it. There are four uh, half circle, four, uh, there are apses on the four sides, absolutely centralized. But that's an awful lot of building to hold a small number of people that are room for down below. Here's the interior of Santa Maria della Consolazione. And now we get to the next huge undertaking, which involved Bramante, uh, the rebuilding of St. Peter's in Rome. The church that had been built by Constantine was a thousand years old. Something had to be done. So there's uh, an interior with, no, there isn't, uh, with the columns running down the side, wooden roof. And now we come to Bramante's design for St. Peter's, produced in 1506. He absolutely had to make it centralized, so there are four arms to the cross. Is this practical in a church? Maybe not, but that's what he did. And he designed a dome that was as like the dome of the Pantheon as he could possibly conceive. It was surrounded by a peristyle of columns. The, the columns are around here, e evenly spaced, and there are small windows uh, between them. And then in the four corners, there are four equal towers. All that symmetry, is it really essential or not? When Raphael painted the school of Athens in for the Pope in the Vatican. This was what the Pope would pass through just outside his study. And it doesn't look like a very Christian subject, does it? The school of Athens. 
This is the age of humanism. This is the age when philosophy from the ancients uh, is as valuable uh, as the Holy Writ. So I could spend a long time talking about this painting, but I don't have time really. The figures standing at the top of the steps are ancient Greeks, philosophers, Plato and Aristotle. But I seem to remember that Plato is also Leonardo da Vinci. Why not? Why not? And then sprawled on the steps is the philosopher Diogenes. And what philosopher this is, I'm not sure, but the model for it is Michelangelo. And Euclid is having a little sort of geometry party, a mathematics party over in this side. They're not at all interested in what's going on in the rest of the scene. Uh, but, and then up here uh, we have Apollo and Aphrodite. So we've strayed a little from from one god. <laughs> but my god, what a painting. Oh, uh. Now let's see what happened next to St. Peter's. There's Bramante's dome. But he hardly got anywhere with the construction. He died. And San Gallo uh, took over. And he obviously did not listen to the 20th century architects. Mies van der Rohe's famous dictum, less is more. I think that Sangolo thought that more is more. <laughs> so let's move on to what Michelangelo did. There's Bramante's dome. Michelangelo makes the dome a little higher, which from a structural point of view uh, was wise because uh, the weight was more going downwards. Uh, and uh, Michelangelo builds a high wall uh, articulated with pilasters on two levels around it and two small domes over lanterns. Uh, but San Gallo's, <coughs> did I show this to you this before? Did I, did I press the wrong buttons? You went I went, okay, yes. All right, I've been, we've seen this before. No, th th yeah. so this is San Gallo uh, doing a complete mess. Oh. I love this picture. I don't know which pope that is, but there's the old church, and you can see. It's overlaid with a plan of the east end of the new church. Maybe this man uh, with the laurel wreath is an architect. This was what was built by the time that Michelangelo began work. These huge uh, arches that would support the dome. You can see they're very deep from uh, from the outside to the inside and sufficient to carry the dome. And then there's as far, that's as far as it had got uh, by the time of Michelangelo's death. Four plans. Bramante's plan, absolutely bilateral symmetry in all directions. Raphael did another plan. He was not an architect so much as a painter. But look how Michelangelo pulled it all together and made it more compact, though in fact it was given a longer nave in the long run. So Michelangelo couples columns against the wall. We see alternating windows and two columns. Uh, that gives a more dynamic upward thrust, I think, certainly than the way that Bramante did it. 
and those columns uh, are directly underneath exterior ribs on the outside of the dome. Uh, so there is a feeling uh, of a grand upward thrust. Uh, I keep doing that. So let's see that Brunelleschi's dome influenced Michelangelo. Of course, uh, Michelangelo grew up in the shadow of Brunelleschi's dome, and that verticality on the skyline was something that was to influence many domes in the future. The Pantheon, you can hardly see the dome uh, when you're standing in the piazza in front of it. Uh, but this rises up to a point uh, with a powerful lantern and doubled columns on, uh, on the lantern echoing uh, those on the drum of the dome. Ooh, wait a minute. So here's Brunelleschi and Michelangelo, and here is the interior of Michelangelo's dome. Michelangelo was, first of all, a sculptor, but the building of great churches is a form of sculpture, I suppose, uh, and this uh, is a high point. So that brings us too rapidly to the end of the Renaissance. It would be more appropriate to have an entire course uh, on the Italian Renaissance. But since we're following this theme of the domes, we're going through history. Next time, we will uh, look at some Baroque domes at the beginning. I added those to what I originally intended. And then we come uh, to St. Paul's Cathedral in London, uh, designed by Christopher Wren. And I've gone on a bit long. Oh, we still have a bit of time. We have a bit of time for questions. Um, <clears throat> Henry, the a question that occurs, uh, if we follow the change from the Pantheon, ancient Rome, to the Renaissance, uh, the dome in the Pantheon was, um, could be held up because they had a, a lighter weight concrete than, than the materials used in the Renaissance with its coffers. And also, it rested on the, the drum was very heavy. The drum was immensely heavy. Right. Uh, as and Grant pointed out, there were actually uh, rectangles taken out of the drum on the ground level. Uh, but uh, the Still, there was enough width was, there to, the width to carry a lateral thrust. Yes, 21 feet. Um, <clears throat> but then we get to the Renaissance and um, uh, Brunelleschi's dome and, and uh, Florence and Michelangelo's uh, at St. Peter's. Um, I'm just wondering what, there, which, despite the fact that they were taller, they weren't strictly circular domes, um, there would still be a lateral thrust at the base of the dome. And I'm wondering how that was uh, contained or. Um, you know, I, I, I believe the. I, I, I have a habit of forgetting things. I believe there was a metal chain uh, in the base of Michelangelo's drum. I'll, I'll have to look that up. Uh, yes. We're wondering what the materials used were for, to build the domes. I should have shown the brickwork of Michelangelo, of Brunelleschi's dome. Uh, the dome. Uh, my, uh, Brunelleschi's dome uh, was made of brickwork, and he had specially made grid bricks that were the right size uh, and shape uh, to interlock uh, on a curving surface. Uh, 
the dome of St. Peter's, I'm sure, is stoned. Henry? Yes? Why was the dome considered an essential element of a church? Well, you've been a minister. You should be able to... Ah, come on. <laughs> Uh, I, w I was a Protestant, so we didn't build domes on our churches. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a very good question. And they, and they all have an open opening at the top. Yes. Is that so we can get through to heaven? Is that what it is? <laughs> well, you wouldn't know the answer to that. No. But here's, uh, yeah, the lantern on the top uh, lets light through in addition to the light that's coming around uh, the edge. I think I think that Brunelli did, that they just couldn't resist a dome once Romans had built domes. Yes. Henry, I have a vague memory of a story about how Brunelleschi got chosen, and it has to do with some kind of a contest where they were insisting that what he wanted to do was impossible. Right. And he finally showed up one day with an egg and smacked the egg down on the table and said, that's how I'm going to do it. Tell us how that really happened. You told it so well, I don't need to. That, that is the story. Uh, but he, he, did build, he did build a model of it, and he built a small experimental structure. They, no, the committee couldn't believe that he could do it. This is not exactly on the topic of domes, but the centralized church. I was at a concert in St. James a few days ago. Yes. And I was thinking about its design as cathedral design. It's, it's certainly not the, the Gothic model because it's, it's more, more Renaissance, but it's sort of a centralized church, and especially when they put the altar in the, right in the center. Yes. But it has very short cross on cross And there's on been chances. a movement in the Catholic church and, uh, and in the uh, Church of England, too, to move altars closer to the center of churches, whereas they might have been uh, in a distant choir. Uh -huh. uh, they were moved, they've often been removed to the crossing, crossing between the nave and the transepts. So, and that's, and there is a kind of dome design over the, over the uh, altar, but this was an, this was an a cappella choir and those voices in that huge open domed space was, were just fabulous. They resounded so beautifully. Well, I once went to Florence Cathedral on Christmas Day. Oh, wow. And it was absolutely crowded. The choir was singing. It was absolutely magnificent. And then they had a wire going from over the high altar to the roof of the baptistry. And on the wire, they had a, fire, a, a dove propelled by a, a rocket, and they <laughs> lit it in the cathedral, and they went zooming up the nave uh, through the door. Uh, I, I think that's terrific. <laughs> it's imaginative. Any more questions? I have a comment, which you won't like because it's not positive. I've always found Brunelleschi's church is very cold compared to the wonderful gold, warm spirituality of other churches. So all that gray. What do you think? Well, I, I, I find those, uh, those churches very serene. And he got through to me with his proportions and harmony, uh, which overcame everything else for me, I think. Rational, maybe that's what bothers me. The rational, that could be a problem. <laughs> I mean, churches aren't supposed to be rational. No, they're celebrating the irrational. <laughs> Any other comments? Okay. It's one at the back. No, she was just waving her arms around. Oh. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Well, next week I will go to uh, Wren and St. Paul's. I do a little bit of. Baroque domes. I couldn't leave out a few Baroque domes, which are odd shapes and quite extraordinary. And then I go to St. Paul's Cathedral 
and finish up with the Amer American state houses influenced by England. Okay.